just say a toe to so. You know what? A toe to so. A fucking a toe to so. I'm going to start today with a quote. It's from someone's diary. I'm going to have you guys guess whose diary it's from. At luncheon, looking at my teacup... I saw very clearly a soldier in uniform standing with his legs apart, as though over some sort of open space with objects on either side, which might have been bodies of men or lumps of earth. I showed the teacup to McLeod. I asked him what he, uh, what he saw. He said, without a word to me, a soldier standing with his legs apart. I said to him, it probably has reference to the war in Africa. This is from a diary entry, February 7, 1941. Um, I want to ask you guys, do, who do, who wrote this? Who do you think wrote this? Uh, well, I mean, I, I could guess, but I feel like I'd be cheating, so I won't yeah. do it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say this is a, a passage from the famous book series, uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Is it from <laughs> the Diary of a Wimpy Kid? <laughs> yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, no, it's, it's from the Diary of a uh, revered Canadian statesman, Mackenzie King, um, uh, one of our greatest historical figures. Um, and today on The Bottleman, uh, we have Matt Chrisman on. Hello, Matt. Uh, hey, hey, thanks. To uh, to delve into uh, the occult leanings of uh, the type of person Riley has described in the past as a 19th century ice-chewing Protestant. So, yeah. Uh- I mean, it's it's just I I sort of grew up basically understanding uh, Mackenzie King as um, like just basically one of the one of the flyover prime ministers. You know, you don't think about them that much. Uh, they're just sort of there soaking up space uh, before uh, you know we get to Trudeau and we start to really think of ourselves as you know it, it, it is it's um it's 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 not Pearson, it's not Trudeau, it's just someone who was there for a while. And sort of is is there to occupy lists. I never knew there was anything oddball about him. Excuse me, sir, but he was ranked as the number one greatest Canadian prime minister by a survey of Canadian historians. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. He also s- and he was the World War II prime minister. It kind of makes him the Churchill of Canada. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna get into how he is like and unlike Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> specifically with his attitude towards uh, a failed Austrian painter. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, th- bef- before we dive in, I-, I think we need to sort of define some terms. And uh, one, of- one of these terms is uh, the occult or esoter- uh, esotericism, you know, like esoteric thought. And there are a couple different interpretations of what constitutes the occult or esoteric thought. Like one school sees it as a hidden inner tradition. Uh, another school sees it as like a storage locker for Western civilization's uh, rejected knowledge and theories. For me, the most interesting view is that uh, it is like a broad group of practices that encourage an enchanted worldview in the face of uh, increasing disenchantment. And in doing research for this record, uh, episode, I, I found out that, ironically, it was a, it was a very dour Lutheran named uh, Ergot Kohlberg who attempted to draw all of these uh, disparate strands together in this critical uh, 1690 book called The Platonish Hermeneutish Christianity. And in an attempt to identify heretical thought, he accidentally ended up codifying and linking together a bunch of separate ideologies. Ah, uh, damn and- it. <laughs> oh, I hate when that happens. <laughs> it, it really sort of stepped on a bit of a theological rake here. Yeah. Um, but, Matt, I'm I wanted to ask you... trying to banish like, what- these spirits, not call them into being. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to ask you what, uh, you know, if you were going to give a definition of this of, of this broad kind of ideology and, and why it seems to resurface at certain points of history. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, it is what you said about an attempt to re-enchant a world that's being disenchanted uh, is the most pithy and, and accurate description. You, you see it popping up again and again as as uh, rationalization, rationalism, as uh, empiricism, as as enlightenment notions uh, begin to permeate, and then 
as a result of that, as technology begins to sort of uh, take over for human agency uh, in, in our lives and, and we find less and less of a place for our like animal spirit to be, uh, to be let loose. And as, especially for middle class people, that those people who are perpetually stuck in that precarious hothouse between the uh, absolutely uh, uh, the decadent, ultra powerful, and and the toiling masses, uh, that, that there is a a constant need to reassert control uh, in a world that feels less and less human, and uh, that that phenomena that, that desire ends up manifesting itself a lot of the times in. In, in occultism, and it, it's not a coincidence that the real, the, the first rig boom of modern occultism is in the, the late 1800s as capitalism, as the Industrial Revolution really take hold in the West, uh, and, it, and you see it running through circles of, of, of people in that political class, in the striving categories mm -hmm. all through the 20th century. I mean, you even see sort of discussions of like, especially, you know, like sort of a gothic form of magic throughout Marx as well. You know, I think it's no, he he's he, he talking about sort of capital as a vampire, this kind of thing. Like it is, it, it's, it's sort of people who are, people are very sort of concerned with, um, people are, are, they're very concerned with, with the ideas of sort of, of, of the mystic at, at, at the time, like whether they're sort of, whether they know it or not, I think. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, and you see, you see it kind of, uh, you know, especially in this first incarnation, like like Matt, you were saying, like post industrial revolution, pop up as like the rediscovery of Gnosticism, uh, and then weird mutations like the the Russian cosmist, like Morozov's theory of missing time that like Charlemagne did not exist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's one of my personal favorites. Oh, that one's great. Just like, yeah, they just uh, went into the books and they just said, uh, yeah, let's just add some time here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's just add some people here so that people don't know that it's all been Russia the whole time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was it, people couldn't handle it if this was all the Russians. So we got to pretend that it's these uh, like the, that the Franks existed. Yeah. Yeah. The Slavic the Slavic truth is too much for the masses. Yeah. Can't take it. So now that we've. Now that we've defined that, uh, we have to define the vessel uh, in in, w in which this uh, this esoteric thought would inhabit. Uh, Mackenzie King, you know, uh, our our big boy Protestant prime minister. Um, mm -hmm. He was born in uh, 1874 in December in Berlin, Ontario, which uh, does not exist anymore. Berlin, Ontario, is now Kitchener. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the Kitchener Waterloo axis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's 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 very that's some good shit right there. Yeah, I uh, mean, World War One starts. It's like no, no, no. Uh, the guy who's pointing in the posters in England. That's the name of it. Not not Berlin. No, never. Yeah. Um, my German there, relatives there are from. There ain't no beer hall here, and there never was. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. My German relatives uh, are are from New Hamburg. So <laughs> there is a uh, suburb of Milwaukee called New New Berlin, which I am. 1,000% convinced used to be pronounced New Berlin. Mm -hmm. And everyone decided instead of changing the name, they were just going to change how they pronounced it. <laughs> New Berlin? <laughs> yeah, they call it New Berlin. Is it spelled uh, like Berlin? Yes, B-E-R-L-I-N, yes. Is, is there a it's spelled New Berlin, but we all pronounce it New Berlin. D did they, is, I and mean. have presumably since 19, uh, 1918. That's kind of space? like a New England type pronunciation, like New Berlin. It sounds like Newbury or something like that. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it definitely sounds like somewhere where like, I don't know, like a, like a Rockefeller would have committed a thrill kill. <laughs> that's, uh, I got to say, that's uh, Oaf Erasure. You see that in Ontario. Uh Obviously, you see it in the American Midwest, but mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we had. Yeah, to, I don't cotton to it. Yeah, we had to. We had to get. We had to. We had to remove remove all marks of oaf culture from Ontario. It's sad. Yeah. Um. So so King is born in Berlin, uh, Ontario, and yeah, he would he would serve three non consecutive terms as Prime Minister of Canada. That's twenty two years of Mackenzie King. Uh, he was a technocrat. He was an early booster of liberal corporatism, um, and he was also famously lacking in charisma, oratory skills, or what people call uh, pre quote unquote presence. 
Yeah. Gee, I wonder what uh, he was able to use to supplement those things <laughs> to get him a political career. It's pro- probably some kind, some co- some kind of deal with certain uh, dark forces, perhaps. Yes. Yes. You know, you, the, the, yeah, as, as he, it was like, uh, if I'm when I'm prime minister for three terms, then my soul gets eaten by Baphomet for eternity. But I just have to make sure I never finish my third term. And I will be a charismatic politic. Little did he know the Canadians loved him too much and condemned yeah. him to a life of, uh, of eternal torment. Listen, you guys have to reelect me. Otherwise, I will be flayed alive for eternity on the obsidian punishment stone. <laughs> Um, he he grew up in uh, a Look, he life was a of... cat walking on his hind legs. What was I supposed to do? Not make a deal with him? <laughs> exactly. Uh, he grew up in what, a life of what he described as uh, shabby gentility. So his his parents were part of that precarious middle class that you were talking about, Matt. Like they were basically paying for servants that the the family could barely afford, and uh, and he grew up deeply Presbyterian. So. Matt, I was hoping you could explain to the audience, just give them a rundown of Presbyterianism. Oh, baby. Uh, the ca- the Presbyterians were the turbo ca- uh, Protestants. When uh, <laughs> Protestantism came to the United Kingdom uh, and they they started uh, tearing down the, the uh, you know, tearing down the idols of the of the of uh, the whore of Babylon in England. And the Scots said, that's cute. L- let me show you how it's done. Uh, and. <laughs> Scotch Presbyterianism, uh, the the fanaticism of the Scotch Presbyterian <clears throat> Church was the actual like precipitating force that led to the English Civil War, uh, and led then to an alliance between the Scottish Presbyterians and the the Puritans under under Cromwell that eventually fell apart because the Scots would not chill the fuck out. <laughs> uh, there there is a point where uh, Cromwell is trying to get them to stop their uh, their maximalist push for a radically uh, de-hierarchized church. And he wrote a letter to them saying, uh, from the bowels of Christ, I beg you to please consider that you are mistaken. And they said, uh, nope. And so he ended up <laughs> having to go to war with them to just get them to chill the fuck out. Uh, and then they basically, most of the, the, the most intense ones dealt with it the way that all the most intense turbo Protestants of the UK did by moving to uh, the colonies and just creating their own psycho world there. Mm. And uh, they're definitely, they're disproportionately influential in Canada because of all the fucking Scots that Canada had. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, if uh, the subject of our last free episode, KC Irving, was, if you recall, uh, Matt, the listeners of the show will have listened to this recently, but uh, Matt, do you know who KC Irving is? I don't. He's the guy. His company owns all of New Brunswick still. It's a private company. They own everything. Every logging, oil, all of it. And Every the tree. description of him was, I think, the perfect description. He was like, he became unimaginably wealthy, controlling every sphere of life in the province, but he refused to ever look at art. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Presbyterian Wahhabist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just like the, that's the perfect description of a, of a Presbyterian for me. I've been thinking about this for a while. Is this guy becomes fabulously wealthy but hates luxury so much he refuses to look at art. He will, we waste. will not allow his gaze a, to fall upon a painting. It is a waste of time, Riley. Yeah, it's time you could be spending uh, acquiring another diaper factory. Make sure no one produces a diaper without your say so. Um, yeah, but, they lo- they loved aus- austerity. They loved yeah. it. Yeah, well, it's like it's a Presbyterianism yeah, no. is the religion that gave us different snacks to keep you from jacking off. That's right. right. Like, yes, that's, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, John Harvey Kellogg. That was yeah. like that is the na- <laughs> that's the nature of it, which is like, well, if I add some more suffering, maybe I could also deprive myself of pleasure. It'll be like a double <laughs> a double victory. <laughs> Life on this earth is suffering, but is it suffering enough? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I it, but like it's it's like so like the Cape like the Cape Breton Presbyterian Scots are like it just were this in, enormous sort of um uh, voting block that just sort of not voting block cultural block that just emerged en masse and like the reason that you can't pick up a drink in Toronto and carry it across a room is because the Scotch Presbyterians and the United Empire loyalists got together to decide that like hooliganism was something that had to be fought and the main way to do that is to make it illegal to stand up at a bar in uh ontario until about 1984 yes <laughs> yeah the founder of presbyterianism john knox uh famously wrote a pamphlet 
uh, called The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. Uh, <laughs> Uh, talk, and it's basically an argument that it is uh, it's ungodly to have a female monarch. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole thing is it's basically just like, well, that's, that's the weird thing, right? I, I, ideologies like that generally are sort of, you know, um, recipes for kind of like, you know, in, intentional communities that end in cannibalism. But in this case, yeah. it sort of yes. it sort of was an intentional community that ended like defining this uh, uh, political and social culture of Canada for generations. Yes. Yeah. And for the listeners, I want Especially you to Eastern hold, Canada. I want you to hold this in your mind. The, the two poles of, of uh, the sort of colonial backbone of Canada. On one side, you have the oaf. And then on the other side, you have these Presbyterians who I would define as anti oafs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. this is this is the fabric of uh of our society so that's also very true of uh, a region that's similar uh the um the upper northwest where the, the upper northwest not where i'm from wisconsin uh, minnesota uh the, those places were originally settled by the anti oafs by our our psycho protestants uh the the uh puritan congregationalists of new england and then the settlement, though, over the course of the 19th century was filled out with nothing but oafs. It's just a stream of <laughs> oafs from Ireland, uh, Poland, and uh, southern Germany, most of all. Uh, just these round, red-faced guys who just want to drink a stein of beer and uh, be driven into unconsciousness by sausages. Yeah. Uh, being ruled over by these dour-ass Puritans. Well, sure. Ro- Rob Ford, the, uh, the Catholic mayor of Toronto, could not cope with the level of responsibility and uh, you know, ended up ended up just sort of you know, oafing himself to death. Oh, because he uh, was yeah. br- he was breaking the uh, the the heavenly given framework of this country, which is you have your oaves and you have your oaf oaf overseers. You know, it, and we're like we're he, back with David Miller, who's a classic oaf overseer. It, it, it's it, we we must we must keep the great chain of being in order. That's right. Uh, so. So King, our our anti oaf, uh, he he goes to uh, Toronto University and he gets his uh, BA, and he is a member of something called the Kappa Alpha Society, which is uh, yeah. one of the one of the first secret societies. Riley, do you want to? Yeah. Wanna... So it's basically uh, it, it's it was a, it, it, the, one of the first I think Greek institutions, uh, and it was ended up being split by uh the civil war <laughs> into the uh the union and confederate uh ka chapters <laughs> so you have the kappa alpha order i think it's called which is the one they were like we're going with the confederates and then the the kappa alpha society uh, is being like we're going to go with the, the 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 other one the unions um and it's uh it, it's it's a very small organization it's like it's very small it's like at like a university of toronto University of Western Ontario, and then like a couple of liberal arts colleges, uh, but it also like it's um, I mean like a William and Mary Hobart this kind of thing, um, and it's uh, it's another sort of vaguely like I I because I, I, I went, before I moved to to Britain I, I studied at the University of Toronto I I knew a bunch of guys uh, who were in it and it was like they all wore little keys around their necks. Um, for doing and... key bumps, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, I, uh, I, it's, who can say? Uh, uh, but like, there's, there is, the, there is a much more of a sort of scent of the occult, or at least the sort of the practices of the. No, I'm not saying that that they're sort of doing like occult shit, but like there are certainly are a lot, a lot of the scent of the practices of the occult around it. Like now, it's sort of indistinguishable from a fraternity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in in that time, you know, I imagine things would have been slightly possibly more serious more different sort of styling itself as as it does as as unlike a fraternity but a literary society um i don't know i don't i sort of don't know too many details but you do get a sense that it's different in that it has it has sort of has these these, this connect it or it, it maintains at least through some kind of ritual a connection with with you know the the occult and the mystical or there's coffin related rituals and whatnot yeah. uh an, an odd duck that one um but uh, yes king king was in our one of our our, our first frat boy uh pms uh yeah, he did was... a uh did a did a reversed uh the reverse keg stand uh in the uh on sussex drive uh spent the entirety of his uh, of his premiership with an upside down visor on very cool 
Yeah. So he, he uses his connections uh, that he makes at Toronto University to get a PhD from Harvard for a dissertation entitled Oriental Immigration to Canada. Oof. I'm I sure mean, he was in favor. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure he thought it would be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It basically it's, gets a PhD in early Dinesh D'Souza studies. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Just basically a phrenology PhD. He um, he briefly serves as labor minister and then uh, the government he's part of is ousted in 1911, after which he goes to work for Rockefeller and oh, yeah. Rockefeller pays him six times what he was earning in government. So it's it's kind of a big incentive for him to move to the U.S. Um, as we all know, the early 1910s are a fairly chaotic time for labor uprisings in America. And King's job was to advise Rockefeller on things like the Ludlow Massacre uh, and the strike of 1913. So he takes these experiences and he writes a book called Humanity, uh, a study in principles underlying industrial revolution, in which he emphasized that capital and labor are... <laughs> Natural allies who only needed, quote, the public at large to act as a mediator. Um, yep. Capital, labor, and the public. <laughs> and the rest. Yes. And King, King hated uh, syndicates and unions because, and this is, this is from that book, because they, quote, aimed toward the destruction by force uh, of existing organization and the transfer of industrial capital from the present possessors to themselves, meaning the unions and syndicates. So that's. I, I, gotta, I have that's a question what, actually for for Matt as the sort of the know the knower of things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in this regard, right? It's it feels strange to me that there is that this this guy who sort of became as as we sort of get into as we go on this very like doing seances. This guy who fully believed in magic, right, and believed he could do magic was at the same time. Almost like a the kind of technocrat that like a I don't know a, a Woodrow Wilson Democrat would recognize uh, that those two characteristics seem to like f sit beside one another relatively uncomfortably in my mind. Uh, can you help me square that circle? Well, th so if you are a technocrat, mm -hmm. if you are someone who understands the mechanisms of governance. You know <laughs> that fucking labor and capital don't fuck have an inherent conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. It is not you. You cannot observe the world around you without seeing that it is part of the the empiric uh, observations that you are using to come to your technocratic conclusion. Mm -hmm. But that fact is a fact that cannot be assumed into one's politics consciously without turning you into some sort of socialist, mm -hmm. which if you want to be a technocrat, if you want to actually run things is not an option. So uh, that's where the, the, the occult stuff comes in because the occult is the attempt to mystically bring together op opposites mm -hmm. to create a synthesis out of uh, polarized elements. And you could argue that the entire uh, early 20th century project uh of dealing with the emergent and incredibly violent uh, cr uh crisis of capitalism that was uh that characterized that period uh is is a bunch of people trying to do uh do magic tricks essentially mm -hmm. uh i mean the the or the nazi party had a cult uh basis as well fascism is is uh frequently fixated on the occult uh and, and everywhere that middle class mostly people are trying to square this unsquarable circle uh they are turning towards uh the spirits to help them uh because that's the only one who's going to get it done because the objective conditions are undeniable that the conflict cannot be resolved so it's it's sort of it's it's all just different kinds of magical thinking in effect yes yeah okay and then yeah. then different performances of that they're different ways of uh of because you have to convince yourself and you have to do that through ritual reaffirmation and yeah. uh, whether it's seances or uh, whatever the hell Hitler was doing when he was screaming in his sleep, which yeah. everyone uh, has uh, talked about. Julian who, rune uh, magic. Yeah, exactly. Whatever it is, like fucking Himmler with his sauna rond and all that shit. Uh, it's all it's you are imagining that you can create a harmonic 
social being out of these conflicting and contradictory elements Mm -hmm. instead of uh, defeating the one (laughs) on behalf of the other, which puts you outside of the of the realm of uh, except of bourgeois life, which is what is deeper to these people than anything else. I, you can almost see that there with the public at large to act as a mediator. Sort of that's the spirit you're in, you're sort of summoning is the kind of, in this case, the spirit of uh, collegiality <laughs> to, right. you know, of that, that these, 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 um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great, uh, that's a great keystone here. Yeah. This idea that it's all just different kinds of, of Gnosticism. It's just, or mysticism. It's just one kind of mysticism has like a political science degree and, you know, the, uh, the other kind of mysticism has a cloak. But it's still it's attempting to sort of use kind of just speech words, the sort of extension of individual, the, the extension of the self through willpower, which it seems like a lot of, sort of the practice of magic is I point at something, I make it move. I've extended myself over to that area. Mm-hmm. You know, it's um, whether whether it's that or, you know, the the um, <clears throat> this idea that if we only find the right. Some 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 policy tweak, then you know we will have a harmonious existence between capital and labor. That just and we put the we put we put the the circle squaring act into like this uh, this ghost of the public. You know, it's just it's um so uh, yeah that, that makes sense to me. I get that. I uh, I buy that. Yeah, and th- this was a facet of of King's life, the way he ordered his own reality and and a practice he was he was deeply involved in that he kept very private from the public so you know his legacy the way people thought of him his enshrined image was this dull but dull charmless but hard-working you know uh protestant overlord but that image became completely corrupted after his death because he kept a diary (laughs) uh he for every every day for 57 years, uh, King recorded the minutia of his life. Uh, meetings, travel, meals, philosophical musings, uh, descriptions of government process, uh, the grim Presbyterian church services that he went to, and the seances that he attended, um, where he would attempt to conjure uh, the spirit of his dead mother uh, and occasionally his pets. Um, mm-hmm. King's stated desire was that the diary should not be exposed to the public, that uh, some of it should be destroyed. But it became don't want anyone contacting your mother. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. exactly. But um, but that that really complicated things for his estate after he died. So to cope with this, like, kind of confusing legacy, King's estate selected four literary executors um, who were quote unquote upright men of the civil service. So these are fellow, you know, fellow ice chewing Protestant Mm -hmm. tweed, tweed, tweedmen. Yeah. Uh, Definitely not occultists themselves either. No chance of that. (laughs) Uh, And, and they took their obligations to this, uh, you know, to the, the, as stewards of King's memory uh, really seriously. So they appointed an official biographer, a man named uh, McGregor Dawson, who set to work in the late 1950 or in late 1950 um, with the hope that he could complete the task of, you know, purging and condensing the diary in two years. Dawson died in 1958 and there was still uh, the mountain known as the diary to cope with. So 30,000 pages of King's innermost thoughts. Um <laughs> So the, the question remained how how to handle King's desire to do away with parts of the diary um, and, and decide which ones to, to make public. So, just to be clear, right, what he wanted was like he, he was like, look, he was sort of aware that his, you know, um, uh, penchant for trying to like summon his dead cat or whatever might sort of tarnish his image among sort of uh, right thinking uh, society Canadians. Was that was that the was that the idea here? Yeah, that's that's basically okay. it. Um, in, you know, and then as time went on, like in 1952, uh, the sort of edited version of the diaries came out in the form of a biography entitled The Incredible Canadian. It was the um, first one. There hadn't been one before then. There'd never been an incredible <laughs> Canadian. And, uh, it did mention some of his spiritual practices, but, you know, it was like, it was in an era where there was a deference towards, uh, 
the subject of the biography. So that so it was kind of pulling punches, you know. Mm-hmm. In 1955, there was there was another King biography published that did not pull any punches. It was titled Age of Mackenzie King, The Rise of a Leader. And it was written by two left wing academics, Harry Ferns and Bernard Ostry. And unlike Hutchison, who was aiming for sort of a hagiography of King, uh, Ferns and Ostry wrote this with just like completely uh, gloves off hostility. Um, the account, they didn't get into seances and messages from beyond the grave, um, but they portrayed King as a toady of capitalism. Uh, Austria claimed that some of his research papers were stolen, and then a former minister in King's government managed, in an early uh, early example of cancel culture, um, managed to convince the CBC to shut down a program on the book due to what he called a uh, communist venom on every page. <laughs> um, so, but but inevitably, like like the the efforts of the people around King to sort of preserve his legacy and keep this. Uh, keep the lid on some of the weirder parts of his life it would all it would all fall apart um social mores were changing in canada there was this you know there was a rising tide of individualism and uh and you know king's legacy was going to mutate from stern defender of flinty canadian values to a repressed weirdo who talked to his dead pets uh via psychic conduit i mean that's sort of that's i guess as you say it's kind of inevitable right like it's the, 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 it's, it's like, it's the, as we sort of learn to, as we learn to hate our, uh, our, our wartime prime minister again, it's because, you know, we are, it's society, so to speak, is, uh, reaching out for the villain of a twisted sister music video to bring low. And, you know, the idea that the, this, um, one of the, these, as you say, a stern and flinty Presbyterian would do something to be, make him look ridiculous is sort of exactly where the culture was, was, was what we wanted. We were crying out for it. And, uh, you know, that the CBC would not, uh, w- would not um, uh, 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 sort of go with it is, uh, you know, is, is no, no surprise. I'm a little surprised that the, uh, the two academics, when given sort of a, a, a juicy morsel with which to, um, you know, uh, make, this, make the, the target of their ire look absurd, sort of left that particular, um, left the, that money on the table, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's uh, but it's it's it 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 does seem strange, right? That even though this information was out there, sort of no one uh, did no one care. Did did is it only that is it only that sort of yeah, there this desire to make him look ridiculous came up now? Did it seem sort of just unimportant? Like that's that's sort of what I, that's the question that's in my head right now. And who can say? I mean, I I I think that I I think that legacy could not be contained by the people around him i think there was i think that yeah i think there was a desire to uh sort of puncture puncture this edifice of of king you know yeah i i I buy that so one of the one of the characters that came up you know that comes up as as uh as as sort of the initial doorway into uh king's secret life is a is, is a woman named geraldine cummins uh she was a a uh, short story writer, novelist, a playwright, and a professional athlete, but she spent most of her life as a medium uh, advancing the cause of spiritualism. Um, in the capacity that she'd known King, uh, she she wanted to she wanted to publish her account of their relationship, and the literary executors were appalled uh, and made their displeasure known to Cummins and her lifelong partner Beatrice Gibbs, uh, who said. I have never been so insulted in my own drawing room. This is after they uh, visited uh, visited them to essentially uh, shut down this this book that they were trying to write, mm-hmm. um, and that kind of makes sense considering like the two completely oppositional worlds these these two groups uh, inhabited. You know, it's kind of representing the two parts of King. So Geraldine began work as a medium following uh, the prompting of Hester Dowden and and her partner, uh, E.B. Gibbs. Uh, and her main thing was receiving alleged messages from a, her spirit guide named Aster, who was, uh, according to her, like the spirit of a dead Greek. That um, just happened to be named after a sort of you know, famous, <laughs> like the rich political family from London and New York also. Yeah. Uh, what are the odds? Yeah. So, so we're going to get into King's Diary. Um, King's Diary is 
30,000 pages long. Uh, that's roughly 30 infinite jests. Mm-hmm. And it's a red flag on any man's bookshelf. 30 infinite jests. It is. If, ladies, if you, see the, <laughs> if you see the collected works of Mackenzie King's diary on a man's bookshelf, just turn around and walk out the door. <laughs> He's basically Kevin Spacey in seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, effectively. Uh, yeah. it's a- I've, I, Go ahead. I've, I pulled out a couple of, uh, I pulled out a couple of choice occult passages. I, I read through some of the diary on the, on the national archive. So, uh, you know, the first one I have is, uh, King is visiting his dying brother, Max in Colorado. And, and they talk about life after death. And King writes, I spoke of love being stronger than all else and my belief in, in immortal life. And I told him we would be ever together. And he said to me, you will, you will be with me and I will be with you always. This is from 1922. Mm-hmm. King was certain that departed members of his family continued to exist and remained with him in spirit. Um, he, also, he also kind of used these seances to help him govern uh, for a while. Which, which is kind of a terrifying thought. It goes back to it goes back um, to something that you were saying at the very beginning as well, Matt. Right? Like if if it's if it's all just different kinds of mysticism, whether or not you're using the laugher curve or a seance doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing. Yeah. You just need you need some ritualized validation of what is otherwise a combination of intuition and objective yeah. consideration. But there's no you have to just convince yourself to make yeah. the choice. That's it. And, and that, and that is the self, that is, that is an act of the, you, that is a magic trick you perform on yourself using something, whether it's, yes, uh, the laugh curve on a fucking napkin or communing with your dead mom. <laughs> yeah, my, my, you there. I, yeah. I, a cabinet yeah. of rivals uh, and you can't see any of them. Yeah. Yeah. He, so he, he really takes interest in this in, in 1925. Um, he consults uh, a woman named Rachel Blearney of uh, Kingston mm-hmm. and, uh, He's fascinated uh, when when he believes that she is able to see, like, like actually see the spirits of his dead mother and his and his brother. It only Max. took her four or five um, guesses to get the names too. It was very impressive. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in the October of that year, he has another reading with Mrs. Blarney, and he asked her to interpret one of his dreams. Um, and and this is kind of a crucial turning point. He's in the middle of an election campaign. And when that prediction, uh, when her prediction that he would win justice after a hard fight proved accurate, he was very impressed mm-hmm. and he just kept going back. Um, you could never hit that one randomly. Never. Not a million years. <laughs> You'll win and it will be difficult. So many, so many variables. Um, he, she predicted the election victory and he continued to have sessions with her over the next few years, but became disappointed and disillusioned when he lost the election of 1930 um, after she suggested that uh, he would win. Um, and, and he kind of stopped seeing her and started seeing another medium uh, <laughs> named Ella Wright from it, Detroit. It is very funny to, that the, uh, you know, this, this, the, the wartime prime minister basically fell for like a professor pigskin type of a trick. You know, where it's like, I just got to keep going to the one that tells me I'm going to win or not. And you tell me, if I, and I'm just going to, I'll find the, the, the direct mailer that always sends me the winning football team. It's, I'm, I'm not going to, none of these losing ones. Yeah, exactly. So he, he continues seeing this woman in, in Detroit and he is utterly convinced that she is uh, in contact with, with these spirits. He says, uh, there can be no doubt whatsoever that the persons I have been talking with were the loved ones and others I have known and who passed away. It was the spirits of the departed. Um, he, so this woman that he's seeing in Detroit is a direct voice medium, um, which means that you know she's contacting the spirit realm and then the spirit realm uh, is talking directly through her. And her method was using a small folding trumpet-shaped instrument. Wait, wait did, did, uh, did King know about the trumpet? Or was this, a, was this an occulted trumpet? He, I th- he knew about the trumpet. So uh, this is King's friend talking about the trumpet. Um, she would put the trumpet in the middle of the circle and it would roll around and stop in front of the person about to receive a message. I remember the thing rolling up to me and giving me quite a rap on the shin. The voice that came out uh, did very much sound like a person I knew who had died. However... We were a bit shaken when she got a hold of someone who was supposed to be French, and that trumpet spoke very bad French. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> so what she's basically doing is kind of, in order to talk to the dead, she's doing like scatting <laughs> through a trumpet, basically. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is this is the trumpet through which I I commune uh, with this. You're you're, you're dead. Your uh, look. All of the dead. All of them. They've all been hanging out with Louis Armstrong, and <laughs> this is how they all talk now. That's right. Um. And, and I think King started feeling a little apprehensive about these uh, sessions. So in his diary, after one of the last sessions, he wrote. Uh, the conversations in many cases have been so loud and so clear that I have felt great embarrassment at the servants in other parts of the house hearing what they uh, what was said, as I'm sure they must have. So he started he started moving the sessions, uh, you know, in private after this. Just because it's like, ah, oh, the, ser- so the he- servants might hear what uh, what my dead mother really thought of them. They, 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 they yeah. might finally drop the fact that we could never really have afforded to keep these people on anyway. Yeah, he, you know, and so he continues doing this over the years, through the war years, uh, right up until 1945. And uh, there's a there's a pretty good entry from 1945 uh, where he's he's visiting uh, the London Spiritualist uh, Alliance in England and uh, does a reading with Hester Dowden and someone named Mrs. Sharplin. He's asking for advice on a Russian espionage case in Canada, which is, uh, I mean, we don't have time to get into it, but the Guzenko affair, basically Mm -hmm. a cipher clerk working in the Soviet embassy in Canada, defects to Canada with a bunch of quote unquote documents proving that there's a spy ring in Canada. Canada institutes the War Measures Act. Um, So so King is dealing with this uh, with this you know, purported mm-hmm. spy ring in Canada. Couldn't possibly, situation of course, is st- have been just the Soviets sowing mass <laughs> discontent in Canada by sending over a, f- a fake um, cipher clerk. It's very, very exactly. clever. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the situation is a state secret, but he does the seance. And uh, according to him, his brother, Max, and the recently late fellow uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt advised to proceed with extreme caution. So according to him, Ghost Roosevelt advises him <laughs> uh, to watch Asia mm-hmm. because that's where, uh, and I'm quoting from his diary, that's where the war danger lays. Yeah. Uh, the Berlin the airlift to China was early. of attention. Yeah, exactly. So Ghost Roosevelt tells him that the Berlin airlift is a Soviet bluff and that he needs to turn his eyes to Asia. <laughs> um, and... You know, one of the big takeaways from this session that that King had was that his mother and FDR are now hanging out in the afterlife. Oh, cool. Um, That's good for her. He says, uh, the phrases he used, the characterization, were exactly what I would have expected from Franklin Roosevelt if he had met my mother in real life. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, uh, that's airtight, in my opinion. Yeah. Look, how how would I know what my mother would say? (laughs) Um, so one of the one of the weirder side effects of King's belief in the occult was was how it colored his impression of uh, of the aforementioned failed Austrian painter, um, someone he became very enamored with on a state visit in 1937. So King's pre-war philosophy had been to say uh, had been quote say nothing about the dictators and hope for the best. <laughs> 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 Mm-hmm. I guess that's one way to handle it. Um, Our but Churchill. His, uh, <laughs> but if you read his diaries, uh, what they reveal is a man who felt kinship towards Hitler um, over over a number of things. Their shared mommy issues uh, and an affinity for the esoteric and the spiritual and their mutual love of Wagner, um, which they talked about at length. <laughs> um, King saw Hitler as kind of a mythic Wagnerian hero who's you know, struggling through an internal battle between good and evil. Um, and it's also a good place to, to just remember that Mackenzie King refused to allow a significant, significant numbers of Jewish refugees into Canada. Uh, well, on the other hand, being in extremely enthusiastic about uh, importing anti-communists. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's the, the of, of course, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's you, you sort of, you're, you are, you, you are someone who is at the decided that you belong at the pinnacle of your society, so you it can benefit from the your um uh, uh your sort of innate goodness. 
of course you're 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 going to feel a lot of camaraderie uh with someone who thinks the same thing about their societies you think you see yourself as uh sort of special special uh people in in sort of almost heroic position it's unsurprising i think yeah yeah absolutely um I'm going to read you guys a, uh, one, of, one of his diary entries, his first impressions of Hitler. So this is June of uh, 1937. Um, he's on this state visit. He's being shown around by um, Walter Huell, who was uh, a German diplomat and, and like very close friend of uh, Adolf Hitler. So this is King's first impression. It is truly marvelous what he, meaning Hitler, Uh, has attained unto himself through self-education. He reminded me a little of Cardin in his way until he begins to speak when he warms up and gets carried away with what he is saying. He has much... (laughs) That's that's pretty funny. Uh, He has much the same composed exterior with uh, with a deep emotional nature within him. His face is much more pre-proposing than his pictures would give the impression of. It is not that of a fiery, overstrained nature, but of a calm, passive man, deeply and thoughtfully in earnest. His skin was smooth. His face face did not present lines of fatigue or weariness. His eyes impressed me most of all. There is a liquid quality about them which indicate keen perception and profound, profound sympathy. He looked most direct at me in our talks together at the time, save when he was speaking at length on one subject. Then he sat composed, looked straight ahead, not hesitating for a word, perfectly, frankly, looking down occasionally towards the translator and occasionally at myself. So, so already King is, um, King is pretty enamored with this guy. Yeah, purely on the basis of looks, <laughs> of vibes. He just loves Hitler. Yeah. Hitler, a man who famously, like, among other things, was not, did not just have, because he, correct me if I'm wrong, right? He was also famous for having quite fucked vibes, right? I mean, he was a speed freak. He was constantly at a vibrating at a low temp at a high frequency but uh you know fellow weirdos love yeah. that kind of thing they're like oh dude this guy he gets it because they're also internally just uh, uh, going insane yeah, yeah exactly I, I think that's a good point matt like i think i think king recognized in hitler the same kind of uh oppositional forces at work mm-hmm. you know like um and and that kind of comes out in this in, in this next uh, section where he's describing uh, he's, he's, he's describing his thoughts after the meeting with Hitler. He says, as I talked to him, I could not think, but uh, I could not but think of Joan of Arc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's, that's who always jumps just, into my mind whenever I think of Hitler. It's Joan of Arc. <laughs> <laughs> he is distinctly a mystic. Huell was telling me that the German people, many of them, begin to feel begin to feel that he was on a mission from God and that some of them would seek to uh, revere him almost as a god. He said Hitler himself tries to avoid that kind of thing. He dislikes any of them thinking of him as anything but a humble citizen who is trying to serve his country. He is a teetotaler and a vegetarian. He is unmarried and uh, abstemious in all of his habits and ways. Indeed, his life, as his one gathers, is from those who are closest to him, would appear to be that very much of a recluse, accepting that he comes in contact with youth and large numbers of people from time to time. So just the Joan of Arc comparison alone is, uh, is pretty incredible. I mean, I bet that uh, Joan of Arc, if you met her, probably had similar vibes. Yeah. <laughs> she was probably similarly very just vibrating. Yes. <laughs> and probably if you just wanted to, you know, go get some pizza or something, you'd be yeah. kind of weirded out. But if you were really fixated on, like, you know, saving saving the race or something you'd be like yeah okay let's link and build <laughs> yeah 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 and and king like further on in these in these recollections of of his or this diary of his state visit um talks at length about uh you know hitler's mysticism and and the idea that uh he wanted to keep like he mentions the he mentions the term uh pure blood a couple of times and and sort of uh a glowing uh context you know I, I think it's actually worth asking a little more like it's I, I'll, I'll i'll admit other than just like the sort of stock phrases like thule and rune magic i kind of know very little about nazi mysticism and sort of what what it was right i, I kind of know the i know that like level of summary but 
I, I, I have very little, I have very little familiarity about how they might have sort of come together over this idea. Um, I, I, I think that's again. I, I turn to our, our, our guest. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you? What is your understanding of what the Nazi mysticism actually was? I, it was it was a notion of that there's a a racial a racial consciousness that like transcends time that that they you can commune with, uh, and that extends uh, in some iterations like off of the planet. You know, like the even at this point there was uh, you know crackpot uh, historiography uh, that said that Aryans were descended uh, from like ice people from another planet. I mean. Like there, there was a, they had, they had enchanted like the concept of the race mm-hmm. and, and turned that into the, uh, uh, like the key, the doorway to, to transcendence is in communing with this, this racial, uh, historiography. And a lot of it involved, uh, reincarnation, like Heinrich Himmler thought that he was the reincarnation of a Saxon mm-hmm. king. That's right. Named Henry the Fowler. <laughs> Uh, so like they feel, and the, like the thousand year Reich, you know, like the, the third Reich, the, the return of, of, of a German empire, they, they thought that they were part of like a cycle of mm-hmm. awakening within this, this racial, uh, this racial mind that was going to eventually come into self, self awareness. And, and, and King so the mysticism of someone like King seems to have a lot, or at least, I mean, if you want to talk about the overt occultism, the stuff that's aesthetically occult rather than sort of the stuff that's like, you know, him like. Just ke- having his mom tell him that um, you know some or other policy is is, is the way to go. Um, it, it's it seems like what what with someone like King, it's much more. He has no sort of social or, he or his the aesthetics of the occult for him don't extend to a social vision. It's more how he sort of deals with his own life. Um, and then yes. you know he he is concerned with the, with the mysticism of the Laffer curve for like managing society. But when it comes to like communing the dead with the dead, doing magic, the the sort of the the cloak aesthetic or whatever for him, that's no. There's no. There is no vision of society there. It's just. It's purely personal. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm sort of speculating. And I would argue. I would argue that the distinction there comes down to uh, the position in the in, uh, in Canada uh, on on the west in the in the Western Hemisphere in in the realm of the free real estate, where where all social conflicts. Can't, they don't have to be uh, uh, transubstantiated mystically. They can be uh, they can be uh, uh, suborned by uh, the furtherance of of settlement and f- by the extension of of, of small holding property mm. to people uh, to to soothe conflicts. Germany didn't have that <laughs> option. That's right. And, uh, and it was and it was in a sense it, it, there was a, a, a feeling that Germany was going to have to fight for its life. If it was going to survive in this new, uh, this new system of like m- m- mechanica- uh, mechanical industrial capitalist nation states in in competition with one another, which is why their long term plan was to do Western the Western expansion, the Western settlement of North America, uh, in the east of in mm-hmm. in the east of Europe, was to get, but they had to do it, mm-hmm. and they had to do it to white citizens of existing. Uh, political systems which required a uh, a greater investment <laughs> in the project a greater mystical investment in their race project than somebody sitting uh in the expansive terrain of mm-hmm. canada where where there is no real social conflict that couldn't be solved with a with a with a, a, a little more uh a little more frontier uh settlement uh it it, it it's a different uh yeah pitch yeah, that you're having to deal with. It's a different it's like, emotional I, I, reality. I, look, we're just gonna keep giving away these small, these small holding ranches, and I assume we'll never run out of them. It'll be fine forever. Yes. Yeah, I mean, but and if they do, if we do, yeah, it yeah. won't be my problem. Yeah, and the the avoiding the avoiding dealing with those contradictions uh, stops when you reach the Pacific mm-hmm. Ocean. Uh, well, they, I guess they we we sort of imagine. Which is why America's in America anyway the the the, the place where, uh, like the the modern modern occultism and mysticism uh, really is generated is California, yes, because that is where the American uh, project becomes mortal, where 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 you can see that that, that this thing is uh, is is limited, and that requires you to to find another 
uh, uh, answer, and that answer has to be found in the spirit realm since it can't be materialized uh, in the world anymore. Well, that's that's how you get the westward mutation of American Christianity from you know uh, Mormonism to Scientology to Synanon and Est to like all the different fractured sort of seventies uh, New Age like uh, either either deep occult systems of ordering reality or pseudo-scientific systems of ordering reality. Because if you look at where sort of the, where if you look where occults and stuff pop up in Canada, it's always in the border regions. It's in BC and Ooh. the border between Quebec and Ontario, basically. It, it's, right. it's, it's all, all of those uh, little liminal spaces where, um, you know, uh, the, 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 Canadi- the great Canadian practice of, uh, of, of oaf management cannot have its uh, contradictions just pushed out a little further. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm uh, from reading these diaries, uh, from reading King's dry descriptions of sitting at a table with uh, different women and having them blow, you know, speak through a trumpet or rap on the table or summon his dead pets. I the lingering impression that I got is that his. Protestant mind managed to bleed out all of the joy from uh, essentially playing pretend or 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 like touching the mystic, you know, <laughs> like touching the mystical. Like, and I, I was thinking about that a lot the last couple of days. Part of the fun, I think, uh, for people who are engaged in, with with like you know the QAnon conspiracy or what or whatever is is pretend. It's fun to pretend. Mm-hmm. It's fun to kind of let yeah. your imagination go. But the way King interfaces with these these uh, esoteric rites is to just shove them in the granite prison of his own Protestant brain and bleed all of the joy out of them. Because Catholics Catholics get to put their mysticism in the catechism. They get to play it out. They get to enjoy it. They get to they get to they get to like so, they get to talk to different ghosts who all have little specialties. Uh, you know, there, there's all there's there's some there's a spirit who can help you um, travel. And if you want to if you're if you're taking a trip, the priest will tell you which of the members of the spirit realm in the form of a saint will help you, like, have a safe journey. The way I think of it is, is that the turbo Protestants, the Calvinists who who did really like they are the brain stem. They're the they're the they were the the colonial overseers, both in the United States and in Canada, the Presbyterians and the and the. Uh, the uh, Puritans, who then became the Congregationalists, these were the leading edge of the uh, British bourgeois, right? Like these were the the first adopters and the most uh, 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 enthusiastic adopters of capitalism uh, in in England and in in Scotland, and and as in being that, they were also the ones who uh, alienated themselves most dramatically and in, in, and earliest from the social fabric that had the Catholic social fabric that had uh, in its basic fundamental understanding a knowledge that there are certain things you can't do if you want to live communally and if you want to feel in your communal life the existence of God and the connection to others. And they said, no, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I would rather make a bunch of money, which means that they essentially talked themselves out of and moved and lived in a way that broke them away from a belief in God that was not rational. And they ha- and they severed themselves from God, and then that is why they all went insane because they had to spend the rest of their life reaffirming their belief in God through reason, through rationality, through all of the 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 proofs that they put together, mm-hmm. uh, and then living in terror that they were doing it wrong, <laughs> because they could not feel any. There was no social uh, reaffirmation of the virtue of their life. They're operating off of the profit motive. They're operating according to the demonic algorithm. They're not operating out of any kind of uh, uh, feedback loop with the people around them. There's there's debtors and creditors. That's it. There's no more. There is no more community of God. And so, mm-hmm. how the hell are they supposed to know if they're going to go to heaven? And so they mm-hmm. don't. And they spend their lives entirely terrified of it. And what they end up doing is sexual uh, is 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 uh, taking all of their libidinal energy. Uh, that you know, in in a Catholic context, could be uh, periodically expressed in you know the carnivals and 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 fleshly pursuits uh, that they could then be redeemed, you know, 
uh, as cyclically as it was within a social uh, context, that all had to be, all of those desires had to be sublimated and turned into uh, this fetishized uh, sexual uh, super ego where all of the enjoyments and pleasures are, mm-hmm. are denied. And then where the pleasure sits is now in the denial mm-hmm. of pleasure. Mm-hmm. And then those perverts end up creating the framework for the United States and Canada. <laughs> yeah, that, that energy is shunted into the discipline and punish yeah. mode. Like, <laughs> and- yes, exactly. Like, yes, it, it, the, the, the pleasure comes from denying the self and punishing others. And, and that is where, uh, you're, that, that's where you're able to blow the mm. steam off. Oaf control, baby. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, well... Riley, do you want to you want to take us out? Yeah, I think, let's do I think it. That's a good place uh, to. So Matt, yeah, I think that's a good yeah, place let's to do end. it. So, uh, Matt, uh, thanks very much for uh, coming on and uh, talking to us about deriving the 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 grand theory of Oaf and the Oaf overseer from the uh, yep. from these uh, tweed and <laughs> tweed covered spiritualist ramblings of uh, the of of uh, uh, of Mackenzie King. Yeah, thank you. It was delightful. Love, love to talk about historical uh, oaf wranglers. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, and uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you all for being a supporter on Patreon. And uh, as per usual, uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, folks. <laughs> <laughs>